Hey, and welcome to the State of Tech Podcast, Episode 3, BYOT, recorded October 22nd, 2011. I'm Sean Beavers, and as always, I'm joined by Eric Hertz and Eric Griffith. How are you guys doing today? Hey, doing just fine. Um, did not uh, get to take a trip to Cancun this week, so I can't uh, share about that like last episode, but uh, my, my trip tonight will be uh, to the Cub Scout Hayride. So I've got my Cub Scout shirt on here. We're doing a, uh, uh, a visit to the farm where the kids can pet the animals and then do a hayride. So that'll be my, my fun experience uh, for tonight. I'm actually a, uh, a tiger den leader. My, my first grade son is, is in my den, and so I uh, get to be, get to be be involved in a lot of those awesome activities. How about you, Eric G? What's happening? Uh, nothing new other than uh, I'm probably going to have to have a long conversation with Time Warner uh, as to why my cable is not working so uh, and why I have to record this at uh, someone else's house. So uh, other than that, it looks like I got my day uh, ahead of me as far as repairing a line. Uh, for now, activity. Now, now, what happens if, if, if the people come home that, 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 that you got into their house? Oh, I, I barricaded the doors. Okay. All so, right. yeah, they shouldn't be able to get in. Excellent. I was going to ask if you just randomly drove through the neighborhood, you know, trying to find houses that had internet. So. Yep. Yep. Back in the day, we called it war driving, and uh, you know, you park in the driveway, and then I just kicked down their back door, and then I barricaded it, and hey, look good. So, yeah. I really appreciate your dedication to this show. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm I'm actually in New Jersey today, so I'm I, my my connection's kind of flaky, and there might be an appearance by the situation during the podcast. So, <laughs> if you don't get alarmed if if that does occur. Uh, well, we also want to. <laughs> I was going to say you are looking a little orange there, so you got the little snooky vibe going on there. I know. <laughs> that's that's great. All right, so we have two very special guests today: uh, Carrie Harrod and Jason Knoll. If you guys just want to say hi. Hello, everybody. Hi. <laughs> and uh, we'll be talking to them a little bit later on in today's show. And if this is the first time you're listening to the State of Tech podcast, just to kind of let you know what this is all about, uh, this is a bi-weekly podcast where we cover uh, educational technology news, um, also ed tech issues, list upcoming trainings and grant opportunities, technology resources, and best practices in and around the state of Ohio. So that's just a little bit about the show. And now we're going to jump into our news uh, for, I guess, the last past two weeks. So... Uh, one of the first things that I wanted to mention is that the sessions now are up for the Ohio, or sorry, for SOIDA's uh, technology conference in Dayton, December 6th and 7th. So the concurrent sessions as well as the hands-on sessions are now listed on SOIDA's website. And that's www.soida.org. And if you click on the link for the SOIDA conference, you can see the sessions that are going to be taking place. And I believe uh, Eric G. and Eric C. are going to be presenting there. Is that correct? Yes, that is that is correct. Um, I'll be doing a session on rolling out Google Apps for Education. Um, Eric, what are you doing? I'm doing two sessions. One is on breaking into people's houses and using their Wi-Fi, <laughs> and uh, the other is deploying Google uh, Google Chrome uh, in the classroom. So, yeah, pushing it over a network. Tons of fun there. So, that sounds like uh, those will be well attended. Hopefully, well attended anyway. <laughs> if we have internet, so. All right, and um, the other thing I want to mention is that there is a, a K-12 Great Lakes regional meetup taking place on December 3rd at SOIDA. So if you are a member of the K-12 Great Lakes Apps Users Group, uh, please sign up. There is a link on the homepage for that, and that is k12greatlakes.appsusersgroup.org, I believe, and you can sign up and join us. All right, other news items that we need to go over? Uh, firstly, the uh, K-12, or I'm sorry, uh, Ohio E-Tech, they're uh, allowing for uh, you to rent their housing or their, their hotel rooms. You can register online for that. Uh, anybody going to be utilizing this or pre-ordering their, their hotel or pre-registering their hotel room? Uh, well, like I said earlier, um, I, I probably won't. I usually don't stay downtown Columbus. I ended up grabbing one of the um, hotels just about 15, 10 or 15 minutes north of Columbus, just inside the 270 Loop. I find that a uh, little bit, a little bit cheaper, a uh, little bit better breakfast in the morning, uh, uh, and uh, free Wi-Fi uh, in those. So I probably won't go go downtown. Uh, but for those that do, it's an excellent opportunity. They fill up fast, so people really should get uh, those signed up real quick if they want to get some of those rooms that. Are right downtown. 
Okay, and uh, I typically uh, sleep in people's cars right before the uh, right before the show, so that's how I save my district money. Um, <laughs> uh, secondly, <laughs> sorry. Secondly, there's a um, 21st Century Skills uh, of Ohio. It's a summit uh, 2.5. Uh, it's announced uh, and it's going to be held on Thursday, December 8th, and uh, more information about that will be available in our show notes. So uh, I will not be attending that, but is anybody here planning on attending that? Nope. Nope. All right, that's all I got. Moving along, Eric, Eric C. Sure. A um, couple of quick things. Um, if you are involved in E-rate for your school district, I first of all feel sorry for you. Um, I, I used to do that and I'm glad to say that is one thing we have outsourced. Um, I, I do not mind letting this one go. But for those of you that are involved in E-rate, um, just as a quick FYI, they are um, doing some E-rate training sessions. Some workshops are going on right now. They did start last week as of this recording, but they are still going through this upcoming week. So if you missed one, very good chance you might still have one that's not a terrible far drive away from you that you can go to. I used to attend these sessions and they are very good. They do a really, really nice job of helping you through all the changes of what's new in E-Rate uh, for the new year. And so if you haven't attended those, uh, you certainly should. Uh, anybody on the panel here ever go to those sessions as well? A long time ago I did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, those are, th those are real good and um, just want to make people aware that those are um, available. Uh, the next thing would be uh, the uh, quick reminder that the K-12 network application deadline is coming up really, really quick here, um, October 31st. So uh, as of this recording, we just have uh, about a week or so left here to get that in to get your money for your connectivity for your district. So please don't miss out on that. As always, the links to all of these things we're sharing are in the show notes, so please visit uh, thestateoftech.org and uh, look at the show notes for this episode, and you can get links to all of these things. All righty. All right, so now uh, we're going to talk about our awesome thing of the week, and some of us, uh, me included, had a little trouble narrowing this down to just one thing because, you know, over the two weeks between our episodes, it seems like a lot of great stuff is happening, uh, so... We're going to be sharing a couple things with you today, and the first thing that I wanted to talk about is this extension, and this is the Chrome Remote Desktop extension. It is in beta, so it's not fully baked yet, but what this allows you to do is remote into uh, someone else's computer using the Chrome browser or if they have a Chrome netbook. So I can just simply connect to uh, my desktop at home if it's got the Chrome browser open or connect to a Chromebook. It'll give you a pin that you just enter on the machine um, that you're using and you'll be able to remote in and control that computer. And it works okay. It's, it's not great, um, but I think, you know, obviously once they probably take the beta stamp off of there, it, it should work pretty smoothly. And then my other awesome thing of the week is that Moodle released the official Moodle app for iOS, and this is available for iPod Touch and iPhone. So there's no iPad version as of yet, um, but this is free in the iTunes Store. Um, they do say that you need to have Moodle 2.1 installed and also uh, Moodle, Moodle Web, or sorry, Mobile Web Services enabled for this to work. Because if you look at the reviews, there are a lot of people saying that you know, this is, it's a poor app, or they gave it one star, but, you know, I, I think the key to that is making sure you have everything set up correctly um, before you download that app. So those are my two awesome things of the week, and uh, Eric C., what do you have for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I likewise chose two things. It was hard to narrow it down, um, and uh, for the first one, let me go ahead and pull this up, um, has to do with YouTube. Now, um, what happened was I was doing some presentations recently uh, for the Stark County Technology Conference, and um, I wanted to have a way to share those presentations online for folks maybe who had missed them. Um, one of them was that rolling out Google Apps uh, presentation, and another one was called a gaggle of uses for Google Apps, uh, where we just went through all sorts of really neat things that we've used Google Apps for in our district. Um, well, those presentations were about an hour long, and um, I thought, well, that'd be great to throw these up online, but I don't know, you know where I could put them, because in my mind, YouTube is a 15-minute limit. I mean, that's how long things can be on YouTube. Well, maybe you guys already knew this. Maybe it was just 
me who did not realize this, but uh, they, uh, about maybe six months ago or so, lifted that limit if you go through a process. And so basically, if you log into your YouTube account, what you want to look for is this section here where it says videos can be you know, up to 15 minutes in length, and then there's a link that says increase your limit. And most people should have that link. Um, to get that link, you basically need to have your account in good standing, which means you haven't been uploading things that are copyright protected and so forth. And then you do have to verify your account with a mobile phone number. So they will ask you to type that number in, and then they'll send you a code, and then you type that code into the site to show you really are a true human. Um, and then once that happens, now it says, congratulations, your account is enabled for uploads longer than 15 minutes. Actually, they can be up to 12 hours long. So, um, you know, really very, very uh, long uh, to put pretty much anything up that you would want to at that point. Uh, so that's what I was able to do. So the rolling out Google Apps for Education um, a presentation I did. It's about a 50 minute presentation that is now up on YouTube and the gaggle of uses for Google Apps for Education about a 45 minute presentation is now up on YouTube and so I think this would be great for schools for all sorts of things. I mean if it's um, Maybe your school um, records your uh, board of ed meetings or, you know, um, if your kids do morning announcements or things like that and they go beyond that 15 minute uh, length, we really do have an option now to be able to just do this on YouTube. And it works the same for uh, Google Apps for Education accounts as well because I was able to turn this on for my personal one as well as my school um, one. So there's that. Um, the second thing to mention real quick is that uh, Google Apps got a update um, this week with the presentation tool, which was really, really, really needed. This has been, uh, we've been waiting a long time to see this. Uh, Google Presentations is Google Apps version of PowerPoint, basically. And um, prior to this, there was a lot of things that it did not do um, that PowerPoint did. It did a nice job, made nice, solid presentations, but it certainly missed some things. Uh, since then, they've now added the ability to do animations, transitions, they put in new themes, you can import images from Picasa, uh, better image alignment options, improved drawing tools, you can draw right on the slides now, uh, rich tables and real-time collaboration. So if you shared it with people, you can just like in docs, you can see people typing and working at the same time. All you have to do is go into your options, a little gear setting in Google Apps, and go into your document settings, and there you'll see an option called editing, and in there you can turn on this option to create new presentations using the latest presentation uh, version. And so, for example, here's a real quick one that I put together for the state of tech and nice little transitions there and then you know you can now animate things like you would normally expect to be able to do in something like PowerPoint and uh, you can even then draw in little lines and animate those as well so a um, lot, of, lot of nice improvements there I know that uh, our school is really excited um, I kind of gathered the same thing from Sean and Eric you guys seemed really thrilled as well is that uh, that accurate? Absolutely. I was going to say, Eric uh, Griffiths is especially excited because they have a Trek, <sighs> Trek theme now. Yes, uh, so he, finally. Uh, he's beside himself, really. Finally, finally. I have to thank the one person at Google who is most likely a Star Trek fan who created that. So thank you. <laughs> Live long and prosper to whoever you are. So really appreciate that. No, but it really is an excellent thing because I think that's been one of the things holding back some of our staff saying, you know, hey, um, we, we like docs, we like the spreadsheets, but the presentation tool just isn't there. And so with this, it can really allow us to say total buy-in now with, with the whole Google Docs suite. It's going to help a lot. All right, Eric G., what do you have? All right. Well, I, uh, I as well was, was forced into choosing two things. Um, uh, the first thing is something that I have used for I can't tell you how long. It's, uh, it's Dropbox. And uh, I know a lot of you use Dropbox out there, but some of you might not know uh, some of the, the neat features of Dropbox. For one, um, every time you invite someone else to Dropbox and they accept their invitation and go through these six steps. They take a tour. They install it on another computer. Uh, all these other, th all these other uh, things. They give you another 250 megs of storage. So if you notice down here, I have 7.75 gigs of storage, which will max out at eight as soon as uh, Sean, you know, accepts my multiple invites um, for storage there. But if you don't know what Dropbox is, it's a great. Um, a great piece of technology. What it does is take any file um, that you have on your PC, um, 
that you put in a folder and then synchronize it between multiple PCs and up in the cloud. So it's a, it's a great service. Um, now you can choose wherever you want uh, that folder to be. You can choose um, which files you, you want to sync and which ones you don't want to sync. Um, so it's a very, very cool uh, website. It also has a mobile version, uh, multiple mobile versions. So Android, uh, iOS, uh, works on Linux, Mac, Windows, all that stuff. So uh, great, great service. So the, uh, the next one is actually called drop, I'm sorry, box.net, and uh, it was either Sean or Eric, I don't recall, I think it was Sean, that told me that box.net, which I, I have a box.net account, and it's a very similar service, um, if you sign in with an iOS uh, device, you download an iPod Touch, iPhone, or iPad, and connect it, they give you 50 gigs for free. They upgrade your, your service to 50 gigs for free. And I did that yesterday, and I saved the screen capture, and yeah, it's, it's awesome, it actually works. So I now have 50 you know, 57.75 gigs of online storage uh, combined between the two services for free. So, excellent way to synchronize your work from home here, school, wherever you need to be. So, those are my, my two, and thanks to Sean for uh, pointing that out for me. So, Yeah, you can't beat 50 gigs for free. That's, that's pretty hard to pass up, so... Yeah. Okay, um, now that we've uh, heard of our, I guess, awesome stuff of the week, uh, let's go back, and as I mentioned earlier, we have two very special guests today, and uh, Carrie Herod, if you want to just introduce yourself again and talk a little bit about what you do and your background. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, Carrie Herod, and I am the uh, instructional technology specialist for our K-12 through public school district um, right outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, prior to that, I spent 19 years in the classroom and then moved over to central office to do what I'm doing right now. For the first five years, I led a group of about 90 teachers each year. Um, they were given a tablet PC and a projector, and they spent the entire year in some professional development with me and just kind of becoming more comfortable with technology and a little bit more fluent with it. So um, I'm glad to be here. All right, excellent. And we're also joined by Jason Knoll. Jason? Hi, um, Jason Olm with Corinthian Networks. Um, we are a IT outsourcing company, um, so we do a lot of education. I have several clients in this greater Cincinnati area that we are assisting with their BYOT rollouts, live at EDU rollouts, and other different rollouts within the education realm. Um, before I started my own company in 2008, I actually worked in education, was the director of IT for a uh, school district. Before that, I was in the enterprise. So. Glad to be here. All right, excellent. So let's kind of jump in, uh, I guess, to the meat and potatoes of today's podcast and, and talking about BYOT and, and why, I guess, uh, Carrie, why did you think that was a good choice or good fit for your district? Well, I, I guess it probably goes back about five years when our school board asked us to take a look at um, a true one-to-one -one type of laptop program. And so we went out to some schools throughout the Ohio. And of course, as you can imagine, there weren't a whole bunch of them in the public sector. And But we, you know, we were able to see some and came back and we told them about it and um, really didn't feel like this was prior to me doing this tablet project with the staff. And so instead of kind of jumping into something like that, we did, you know, we worked with the staff. Well, in the meantime, the board kept asking every year for us to come up with something where we could start providing devices for the students. And so when we looked at the one-to-one, -one, um, basically each time we came back and it was cost prohibitive, we just could not do it, um, It, you know, millions of dollars. And so I think uh, that was the first year I kind of presented a proposal to them. The second year we did kind of a hybrid of a, of a BYO, um, also kind of beefing up our, our inventory of our own devices for kids. That still was really cost prohibitive. So when they asked the third time, I had been hearing a little bit more about BYO, again, mostly in private sector. Um, so we just kind of decided we were going to go for it and this was, um, I guess it was April 2010. And so we uh, went to the board and they approved it and so the official launch was just this past January um, with our seventh graders at our middle school. 
So um, I think probably the biggest reason was because we could see um, in the future that funding was not going to increase ever, or at least not for a long time. And so we knew that we had to do something to get devices in kids' hands and really felt as though we needed to leverage the fact that these kids had devices of their own in many cases. And so that's kind of why we went there. And Jason, you can have a unique perspective, you know, working with a variety of districts and schools, you know, what, what would you think some of the reasons would be that they're looking at this as a viable option? I think a lot of it comes back to um, cost with the economy. Um, you know, everybody's budgets are being cut and there's a, one of the big things we looked at is, I'm sure that most of the public schools are doing this too, is the cart programs we've had. You know, these days we have so many carts and to keep recycling them and keeping them up to date is getting to be too much it's too costly, it's too much to support, you know, they constantly need to be updated, the kids are picking the keys off, you know, and we're looking at different ways to how do we stop the kids from doing that and we thought about the one-to-one -one programs and then we realized that's probably not the good idea. Um, bring, yeah, smartphones. Um, bring your own device seemed to suit that, you know. There's no additional cost to the school. We could actually eliminate some of our carts, take our support needs down, you know, and it looks better in everybody's budget. All right, and I know, um, I think, you know, myself, I really haven't any experience doing this as a um, technology consultant, but Eric Kurtz, you've kind of had, a, you know, you've been kind of dabbling in this, I guess. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experiences with, you know, why you're looking at this for North Canton? Yeah, we're certainly nowhere uh, as far along as Carrie is, and so, you know, I'll defer to her as the expert on this, but we are in the early stages of this as well. Your question, though, on uh, as to why, uh, you know, people are looking in this, I, I certainly would agree with what they've said, that, you know, financially, it really is a big issue. Folks who know about our district and have heard me talk about North Canton, uh, you know, it has been a financial hardship with the loss of the Hoover Company and all the changes in the economy and stuff like that. And so we would have students, you know, asking us, can we bring bring our laptop to school? Can we, you know, use this in school? And, you know, the policy was no electronics, you know, no cell phones, no no nothing, you know. And, and until you have something in place, you kind of have to have that. I mean, I'm not saying that that was wrong with the school. Until you have a system in place, you kind of have to say no. And we were getting students and parents understandably frustrated saying, okay, I come to school and you want me to use seven-year-old 10-year-old computers, I've got this new laptop, I've got this iPad, I've got this smartphone, I can bring it in and I can use it. And we're like, yeah, this would be really nice. And so certainly there is that idea, but then there's also the thing of, um, you know, we, we want to teach responsible use of technology, and that involves all sorts of technology. And so, you know, instead of it being us trying to police all the time, no cell phones, no this, no that, well, what about the proper way to use these things. You know, let's embrace it instead. They've already got it. Let's use it and let's use it to our benefit. It's one of those things we're not going to have to twist their arm. It's not like, oh, here's this new initiative and, you know, we need to somehow, you know, trick them into taking part of it. No, they've already got the cell phones. They've got the tablets. They've got the laptops. It's like if, you know, you build it, they will come. Well, no, they've already built it. They're already, they already have it. We just need to tap into it and take advantage of it. So we did a pilot last year and I can talk about more of that later on and then we are expanding it this year. And I think probably one of the biggest things that people are going to want to know about uh, who are listening to the podcast is, you know, this is sounds all well and good, but, you know, what are the steps necessary to roll that out? Because it's always, you know, what's the investment in time? What's the investment of money? You know, what what's that process? So, um, Jason, I'll, I'll throw it back to you if you want to kind of talk a little bit about that, you know, the rollouts that you've been working on and, and kind of how that works. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest issues that we had is wireless coverage, you know. With the, one of the cool things about bringing your own devices is we can eliminate local storage because if you're using Google solution, you know, they have storage in the cloud. If you're using the Microsoft solution, the same thing with the SkyDrive. And so we need to make sure at both the, both the big locations that I have that are clients currently that our wireless infrastructures can handle, you know, all these kids coming in with these devices. You know, from most of the wireless networks that we've had put it, were put in five years ago. Five years ago, we were thinking people are walking into a place with one device, they need one IP address. Today, I walk in somewhere, I take up five IP addresses alone for myself. So I'm like, you know, and I see the kids doing the same thing. They're coming with a laptop, they've got eye touches, they have an iPad, and, you know, they've got something else. And so we looked at our wireless network. We, we saw, especially my big client, Cincinnati Hills Christian Academy, you know, last year, 
the kids were bringing their own devices. You know, we don't officially have a bring your own device program at the time. And we ran out of IP addresses. And we're like, wow, we had a thousand IP addresses to hand out. How are we running out of addresses? And it's because kids are bringing in multiple devices. And so we had to look at that situation and say, okay, we need to have a robust network. We need to be able to manage that network. We need to be able to also segment that network because now they're bringing in devices that we do not control. So I don't want some kid bringing in hacker tools. I don't want some kid bringing in a virus from home, doing something that would affect our production environment for our teachers and our staff. So that's been um, one of the biggest challenges is getting the wireless infrastructures ready. The other thing is um, communicating to the, to the parents. How do, we, how do we sit down with the parents and even the students? Because we can sit there and say, yeah, an iPad's the perfect tool, and it may not be. We, you know, the kids are gonna, the kids are using everything today. I mean, I don't want to work on a little three-inch device, but kids are fine with that. Um, so we don't want to sit there and say you must have, you know, a Windows machine. You must do this. You must have that. So we want them to be able to choose what they want and make sure that we can support it. It can use our infrastructure. So I think making sure your infrastructure is ready, um, your support staff's ready, your internal teachers are ready for the change. And then talking to the parents and the students about how they would use it, what devices they should be bringing in, what they should expect from the experience. Is a laptop the best choice for your kid? Is a, um, a netbook and an iPad the best choice? You know, carrying two products. Um, is it just one product? It just really depends. Um, so that, that's been our experience with it, is making sure that we cover the infrastructure, we cover the staff, and then we cover the parents and students and talk with all of them and make to, to prepare for this rollout. And that's one of the things I, I, I'm interested in is, you know, what is that, I guess I would call it the baseline. I mean, when you have all these different devices, if you say, okay, you can bring in iPads, you can bring in, um, you know, netbooks, you can bring in maybe even a Windows 8 tablet. I mean, as a teacher, what am I, you know, am I going to say, okay, you have to have a, a WebKit-based browser? I mean, what, what am I teaching to? And I think we're going to talk about that. You know, um, you know, a little bit later on the podcast, but like I said, that's what I'm interested in is, you know, if you've got all these different devices, you know, what about if you have a kid who brings in a, uh, you know, a dumb phone or, or, or a flip phone or something like that? You know, if that's the device that they have, do you have requirements that say this, you must have something that meets these minimum specs? And, and yeah, that's a challenge because, we, I, you know, I don't want to say that a laptop is the ideal solution. It may be the best tool for me. Um, but it may not be the best tool for my four-year-old. Um, she has an iPad, you know, and watching her grow up using technology different than I grew up using technology, it's interesting to see how she interfaces. She's never really sat down and used a PC, and recently we were at the Children's Museum in, in uh, Indianapolis, and they had some computers there. She walked up to it and was like, oh, a door is on the screen. She starts touching the screen. And she looks at me, she goes, Dad, this thing's broke. And I'm like, no, honey, you have to use this thing. See this big pointy <laughs> thing? You kind of have to put this around and match it to the screen. And she was like, oh, I don't like that. So, you know, I don't want to tell a student, this is what you need to use. We're just trying to guide them and looking at how they are using education and what they're trying to accomplish in a classroom. An iPad may be the perfect tool for them. You know, like I said, you know, an iPad and a netbook might be a better solution or a full-blown laptop for somebody. It depends on what your workload is and how you're going to use it. All right, Carrie, do you want to talk a little bit about your rollout in Forest Hills? Sure. Boy, this is a really interesting conversation for me because um, what we found that was that there were really two sides to all this. And, and um, you know, we were just talking kind of about the device side of it. And when we decided that we wanted to do BYO... T, L, whatever, um, we really considered all the different types of devices that were out there. And really paramount to us was that whatever those kids brought in, they could do whatever we needed them to do instructionally. And so it was pretty quick that we decided, it was right around when iPads were coming out and we didn't feel as though we knew enough about them. So what we said was it had to be either a netbook, a notebook, or a tablet PC. And then we didn't forbid kids to bring in the iPad because certainly it was a really um, a device that everybody was attracted to, but we did not um, suggest that parents go that route. And 
and at that point we did not and still do not allow the kids to bring in their um, their smartphones or anything mostly because again if if we're going to do something in class and you can't do it because of your device we didn't want that to interfere with the learning and so it's still really something that we're grappling with because um, certainly there's going to be times where um, a smartphone is going to be absolutely capable to do whatever we want it to do but if that's all the kids are bringing in how are they going to do some of the other work that we you know are asking them to do on kind of the flip side of that we knew right away that we did not want to um, tell parents that every kid had to bring in say a netbook um, and, and it had to be uh, you know a Dell no, uh, netbook and the reason for that is because really and truly when you start looking at 21st century learning it's really all about personalization and about helping kids to learn um, with whatever device they have and becoming capable on that device and so we, we very quickly said that we wanted to be device agnostic and let the kids choose whatever you know manufacturer or whether it was a netbook a notebook or a tablet PC um, we got a little bit of pushback on that quite frankly because I think um, you know teachers uh, that's been probably one of our greatest challenges is kind of uh, shifting that paradigm of where um, everybody comes in they all have Microsoft Word and everybody's going to do a Word document. Well, now what's really great is you can use um, Microsoft Word, you can use do Google Docs, you can use OpenOffice, and we really wanted the kids to start selecting the tools that work best for them. And so um, it's been very interesting. And what we knew right off the uh, f right out of the front gate was that this was going to be very much long-term work with teachers and shifting that whole paradigm. So interesting. So to kind of answer your question, we rolled out um, in January 2011 with our seventh graders um, and it was purely voluntary did not have to do it we were really fortunate in that we already had about hundred and sixty devices at the seventh grade level that were district owned so um, by the time June came we had approximately 353 seventh graders bringing in their own device out of about 560 kids which was awesome we were thrilled about that and then you add to that 353 the 160 and uh, pretty much when you walked into a classroom, um, a student had access to a device when they needed it. Um, so we now have expanded it to eighth grade this year, and we now are really close to about 600 kids bringing in um, a device at our middle school, which is seventh and eighth grade. So, I mean, what do you consider to be, you just were talking about, you know, teachers, I guess, are fearful of, you know, not everybody might have Microsoft Word, or not everybody's going to have, um, you know, the, the, the software that's necessary do you base I mean do you say you must have a capable browser I mean what what are the I guess requirements Minimum. for the device yeah 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 we definitely did that we told parents that they really needed to have you know a browser and we, we suggested you know the, the kind of the big ones um, we also talked about how we felt that they needed to have some you know somewhere like documents where they could do documents but it was about the same time that we rolled out Google Apps for education we were a little nutty last year trying to bring on everything and um, we also an interesting thing is we were looking for a learning management system and certainly looked at the big guy blackboard um, couldn't really afford for that and so uh, ended up with something called Schoology um, and that really what that did for us was that kind of made that consistency because now all teachers at seventh and this year eighth grade are posting assignments uh, the kids can drop assignments into Schoology uh, the kids can have discussions in there it's really been a real powerful thing given the fact that all the kids had different devices. I think, too, it was excellent, though, to try to get teachers out of the idea that were um, kind of that one-size-fits-all type of um, uh, instruction that we've done, you know, for years. That's just basically how we were taught in undergraduate school also. And so it was really nice to kind of push them outside of that. At the same time, you know, it's it's easy to go back to just wanting to do everything consistent with each other. So it's been, it's been a challenge, but a really good challenge, I would say. And so everybody's able to access that on their devices? Mm -hmm. Yes, they can access Google Docs, and what's nice though is everybody has to use Schoology, but not everybody has to use Google um, Docs or the Google Apps. They they can if they want. They certainly, if they have um, the Microsoft Suite, they can use those. I will say um, I'm a huge fan of the Microsoft OneNote, and have not yet found anything that's quite comparable to that. So, um, you know, we did a lot of exposing the kids and the parents to um, to Microsoft OneNote because it's such a wonderful organizing tool for the kids.
And I think they have, I, at least last time I checked, I know they have an iPod Touch version of OneNote, and I think they're rolling out an iPad version, although I'm not 100% sure on that. But yeah, You can they, use it, it on the iPad. Um, it's not very pretty, and it doesn't quite sync correctly. I did some testing with it, and there's like some bullet point stuff that doesn't come across nicely, but I'm hoping Microsoft improves it because it is, it is an incredible app. Mm -hmm. I should also mention that we kind of called our pilot project the Partnership for Powerful Learning and, um, and, I, and very much you know, what we've kind of already talked about in that we understood clearly that this was going to have to be a partnership between the teachers, the students, and the parents. And so um, we, you know, we brought them all on board. And, and, and probably the biggest aha for me was that we have been bringing the teachers along, we've been bringing the kids along, but we weren't bringing the parents along and kind of understanding because kids know how to use technology for gaming, for texting, for, um, you know, for Facebook, but they don't know how to use them uh, instructionally. So it's been, it's been fascinating for us. Uh, Carrie, I got one quick question for you. Uh, it's always been something I've wondered about. I, I hear people talk about how they say, okay, with equity, um, not all the kids have the stuff, so we have some they can use. I'm just curious about the practical thing. How does that work? I mean, where if, if I don't have some, and, and keep in mind, it doesn't necessarily mean that I don't own a device. Um, and we can talk about this later as well, but you know, there's parents who just say, no, I don't want you bringing that in. You know, we've got five iPads at home, but you're not taking it to school. So it could be any, you know, it's not just students who don't own devices, but if they don't bring it in, do they, where do they go in your building to get them? How long are they allowed to check out this device? Um, you know, how's that work? I'm just curious about the practical nature of that. Well, and that's interesting. When we did a survey, kind of a pre-survey before this, four things popped up with the parents. They, they were concerned about the educational value of, you know, the devices that the kids are bringing in, the safety of the students, uh, the security of the devices, and then the fourth thing was the equity. And so right, right from the get-go, we decided to attack all four. But I will say that the equity has been probably one of the more difficult aspects of this. We were fortunate, as I said before, that the seventh and eighth grade already had about 100 160 devices in both grade levels and so as I said there's almost no time where a kid when it calls upon it doesn't have a device you know that is handy for them interestingly though when we get to the high school they don't have that base inventory and so we've already started to look at partnering with some local um, kind of like um, computer stores that are in our area that maybe will take in some um, computers and refurbish them um, and then sell them at a minimum minimal cost. We've also got a foundation in the Forest Hills School District that might be able to help us. So we, we have to be looking at that because all along what we don't want to happen is that you have kind of that the kids that have the devices and the kids that don't. And so that's just something that we're going to have to continue to kind of hammer away at because it is really important to us that any kid that wants one has it. Um, any We do have some kids that could possibly bring one in and choose not to. Um, I would say that at this point right now that that's fine because we're just trying to let them learn in the best way that they can. I think it will be short order before, or not very long at all before um, parents absolutely understand the imperative here, which is that kids understand how to use uh, technology. To also answer that from um, Cincinnati Hills Christian Academy's standpoint, they're looking at having a, a checkout device station, so they are actually pre-buying right now um, some iPads and some laptops to be available for the students who, you know, they, their laptop got a virus, it's at, you know, name your big computer store being repaired, or they dropped it, it's broke, they're getting a new one, they forgot it that day, or whatever else is going to happen with the students so that they can actually check out a device or a device to be there for maybe, there are those students that may not be able to afford it. Um, you know, so they can maybe check out something on a more permanent basis, but they're looking at making sure that they do have devices available for those situations. And do you know, does Cincinnati Hills, do they have, or, or, or the other, um, you know, schools that you've worked with, do they have like a minimum specs, this is what the students are allowed to bring, or it has to be one of these three devices, or what are they, what are they doing? Uh, well, with, with, with CHCA, we, we have been battling with this document for a while. Um, you know, we started off doing this, then we started off doing that, and it's getting to the point. Every time we finish it, a new device comes out. So <laughs> recently, we just kind of like finished the last revision, and we were saying the smallest screen you might want to use in your classroom is nine inches, right? right? So the iPad fits, and then the fire comes out, you know, 
<laughs> or I pull out my, you know, my HP slate and it's seven inches and I can work on this, you know. And so we keep having to revisit that. And we're trying to, we're trying to definitely keep it as general as we can, um, you know. So minimum size now is probably going to drop down to seven inches, maybe six, um, you know. But the big, the big thing is that it really with all this cloud storage that we have with you guys using Google, um, the live at EDU services. That's that's the big thing. Can it connect to the internet? Can you get a browser and can you edit a document on it? That's almost where I'm getting at. And we're also looking at at different schools like um, Summit Country Day and at CHCA. We're looking at the VDI projects. You know, how can I push? If you don't have the app on your machine or I need to get you something, is VDI the solution? Can I push down a virtual desktop to your iPad using VMware View and let you have all the applications you would normally have? So that's another project that's following up behind our bring your own device, you know, project. So are you putting somewhere in that documentation about maybe just having, you know, you have to have some sort of browser that supports these, you know, Java or supports Flash or something along those lines? Yeah, and then at the same time we say that, then we have the iPad. And then I have to say, right. well, note, there's like, I think the, the, the document has all these sub-notes. Like, note, if you use this, this is going to happen. If you use this, be prepared for this. So, um it, that's where we're hoping where maybe rolling out VDI might get around some of that stuff unless HTML5 comes out quickly or Apple finally you know takes on letting Flash happen on the iPad. Yeah, I think that we'll uh, we'll probably see that in 2030. Probably that's my <laughs> that's my I, prediction. Um, I also wanted to add to that in that you know one of the fears that we have, however, is that we don't want the devices to simply be used to um, um, to do searches. Um, to write documents. That is kind of lower level types of things and what we really want to get the kids into is more of the creation because really when you anything you read about 21st century learning is about moving up the, the um, hierarchy of thinking, critical thinking skills. And so that's another thing as we're like looking at the different devices, we want to make sure that the kids are not only consumers of information but also that they're creators of information. And so whatever device that they're bringing in, they better better be able to do that. Um, and so I, I would say right now we're doing a lot of consuming on the devices and maybe not as much creating as we're trying to, you know, we're introducing things like voice thread to the kids and, you know, we were talking about the Google presentation um, uh, app that is inside there. And we really want to get the kids creating and doing some video work and digital storytelling, those types of things. So that's really important to us also. All right, Eric Kurtz, I think you had a comment. Oh, no, I was just going to um, kind of address a little bit about um, the different devices. And, and Carrie, that's, that's a really good point. Uh, in technology, absolutely, we, we, we want to move toward higher level thinking and so forth. Um, but at the same time, um, I think it is you know, good for a district if you don't have a whole lot of devices, uh, if it does give the kids a chance to do a web search, if it gives them a chance just to type something up because otherwise there's just not enough computers around, you know, that can be very, very valuable to a school district. Um, what we did, and again, we're nowhere near where, where you guys are at with that, but what we did was um, we put together a, a survey for our students and for our parents and um, had them take that. and. Um, it asked them questions like, what kind of device do you own? And we really did cast a broad net. Um, we kind of went with five different types of devices. The laptop netbook idea, uh, the tablet computing device, um, like an iPad or a Zoom or Galaxy Tab or so forth, um, an e-reader like a Nook or a Kindle or, or so forth. Um, we included a smartphone you know, iPhone, Android, etc. And then we even went to what we called an internet capable media player, like an iPod Touch, um, because you can still, you know, connect wirelessly and, you know, browse the internet with that. And um, we basically asked, do you own it? And would you like to bring it in? Now, we were asking kids, of course, so, I mean, that's, that's going to be one set of answers. And then we asked them on a positive side what they thought would be good and on a negative side what they thought would be bad. We did the same thing with the parents. And, hey, look at that. We referenced Forest Hills. How about that? <laughs> Hope you don't mind us <laughs> doing that. But right there in the survey, we wanted the parents to know, oh, by the way, you can take a look at somebody who's doing it really well. Um, and so we asked, you know, if your child owns a device, would you allow them to bring it in? And what did you think was positive and negative? And I tell you, Carrie, it sounds like you were reading right off our survey. Those are the mm -hmm. exact same concerns. Mm -hmm. Damage, uh, kids being off task, equity. I mean, right down the line, students and parents saying the mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. What we found out, though, from our students 
Well, it's pretty impressive. Um, this is just the high school here. We, we did the middle school as well, but I'll just show the high school example. 72% um, of them owned a laptop, 28% a tablet, 18% an e-reader, 50% 50, 50 a smartphone, and 71% some sort of a media device like an iPod Touch. And then would you be willing to bring it in? Pretty much all in the 90% range. When you looked at the number of devices they owned, some kids owned all five of those, but basically at least one of them, 90% of our high school students owned at least one device, and 95% said they'd like to bring it in, so that would mean about 85% of the kids could have a device in school. Now we asked the parents, and it wasn't anywhere near as high as that, but I think it was like 78% of the parents said they would be uh, supportive of their kids bringing a device into school. Um, so, you know, we haven't obviously said this is exactly what we're doing, but when, when we did the pilot, it was open to all those devices. When we basically, we got about a dozen teachers or so, maybe, I don't remember, 8, 9, 10, 12 or so teachers who agreed to, to do the pilot, and we put wireless just in their room. Now, since the summer, we've rolled it out across the whole high school, but for the pilot, every teacher got wireless for their room, and the kids were able to bring in any of those devices, and, you know, you find all kinds of creative ways to use it, you know, even if it is in some cases, honestly, a flip phone that isn't even a smartphone, you end up being able to use something like Poll Everywhere to be able to text in an answer and do formative assessments in class. So it's amazing what you can do and, you know, with, with almost any device. Eric, you talked about um, using a different solution for your wireless. What was the product that you guys end up going with? Sure. We went with Meraki. Um, this is... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Me and Eric G, man, we're the Meraki men. Yeah, yeah, the big yeah. M. Yeah, uh, this is one of the Meraki access points. Um, and uh, basically, um, why we looked at a number of things, and, I, and I'm not saying that you know this is the absolute way to go and the best of all. There's certainly lots of great solutions out there. But um, this one worked well for us. Basically, the way Meraki works is you purchase the device, and then you do pay an um, annual uh, cost uh, for support for the device, but it's not massive. It, it, it is very affordable. And again, we're not a rich district. We, we, you know, so if, if we're buying this, it, you have to understand it is, it is definitely a, an affordable solution. Um, and basically what you get is these devices that are completely cloud managed. And so um, everything everything is controlled through a web browser. So we take a device and we look on the back of it and basically um, on the back of it you'll see there's going to be some sort of a, like a serial number or whatever. We get that serial number off, we go onto the Meraki site, we type that in and we've uploaded floor, floor plans of our buildings and we say okay this device is going right there. We drop a pin on the floor plan to say where it's going to go. I walk down the hall plug the sucker in, put it in the ceiling or wherever it's going to be. They work POE, power over, over Ethernet, although you can plug them into power as well, but we just send the power right through the Ethernet cable, and that's it. It's done. I mean, that's that's all. I mean, it's, it's on. It's active. Um, they've got really good... Um, um, really good range as well. We have pretty old buildings and we were we found that in the old buildings, if we put it in the hallway, we could get the rooms on either side next to it, down one, and up one. So we could get six rooms around, and we're talking brick and weird and all these strange old buildings. Now in the high school, it's a newer building, the signal just goes forever, which is, which is really nice. But even these old buildings, one per six rooms would work. Now, they can handle 100 clients at a time as well, which is nice. Previous things That's we nice. were getting, yeah. yeah, previous things we were getting could do about 25 or 30, so you'd have one per classroom. This can do 100 at a time. Now, keep in mind, you know, that still would mean about three classrooms if you really had every single student with something. And, you know, uh, you know, you were absolutely right earlier, Jason, when you said you may have more IP addresses per kid than just one if they've got more devices or a phone or this or that or whatever. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's worked really well, and it's been very easy to manage. And then right from the web console, I can say, okay, I've got this group that has these permissions. So, like, um, what the kids can attach to, all they get is Internet access. That's it. They can't get into our network. They can't get to our file server. They can't get to any of that. But through the exact same access points, we can push out all of these other, you know, configs as well, where teachers would be able to get on and get to the file server and get to other things like that. And it does all kinds of throttling and stuff. We can look at these graphs, and it'll show what the kids are using. We say, oop, this site, ah, they're really abusing this site, even though it's a safe site, you know, because keep in mind, all of our Internet connection is coming through the county, so it's filtered. I mean, it's completely filtered, which is great, but maybe they're 
taking advantage of a site that really you know isn't a bad site but it's eating up too much bandwidth well we can crank that down and say this site can only get five percent of our bandwidth or whatever and we can control all that kind of stuff we can say what time of day to turn it on and what time of day to turn it off it's it's really really nice now um, Eric G you've you've been using it as well uh, did oh. you want to chime in on that Actually, you you took every positive point and uh, nailed it right into the board there. So yeah, I, I can't say enough positive <laughs> positive things about uh, Meraki there. From uh, the only thing I will add, and apparently this is like this for just about every access point, um, you know, power is separate. So uh, that was the one thing that I missed uh, when I ordered uh, my Meraki equipment. That uh, you know the PLE injectors. I knew you'd have to buy a separate PLE injector, but um, which is the the you know device that powers the actual access point. But um, yeah, one is that because you don't have PoE switches? No, you could do. Yeah, you can, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, you you can, but I didn't. I in my infrastructure. But um, right. one of the neatest things, and it's still in beta with Meraki, is the and this kind of sounds creepy, but it's not. But it's the tracking thing. And Eric, maybe you can back me up on that a little bit. When you have one, you know, a device connected, you're able to look at your diagram of the building. And it's going to show where the device technically should be within, I don't know, how many meters. But, I mean, it, it's almost like tracking to make sure, oh, that, that device is here, meaning that student is here. So, I mean, it, it's kind of a neat way to say, oh, yes, they actually, you know, are here. You can have the devices named whatever, you know, the student's name is based on a, a radius server. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really, really neat technology. And when Eric and I first started doing this podcast, that's pretty much all we could talk about. So uh, I was going to say, you can uh, join us after the regular podcast for a post-podcast of Eric and Eric uh, discussing about Meraki. That'll be at least three hours. So <laughs> I mean, <laughs> be good. I, I wish I would have, you know, I wish I would have wished in your first podcast because, you know, we, we end up going with the, the Cisco Clean Air technology, you know, and buying the, you know, the APs that are 3502s or something like that at CHCA. And by the time we put in the management controllers, we pay our, you know, renewal fees and our maintenance fees, the installation of it. I mean, it was a $100,000 project almost. It's just crazy how much the gear looks at. And I, looking at this technology, I'm going, hey, this would be perfect for some of my smaller school districts who I'd love to put a Cisco WAP in, but there's no way I'm paying $1,000 for an access point, you know, and, and not being able to – and using this, I can manage it through the cloud. I, I like this a lot. This is – this is definitely an education product. I was going to say you should have seen uh, Eric uh, Kurtz's every vein on his face just uh, when you said $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think by the time it was done, it was more like eighty. but still, it's ridiculous. I mean, we tapped into auxiliary funds. I mean, we, we really, it was very difficult because we didn't have the money to do it, and we looked at every place we could get money back. You know, E-rate, auxiliary funds, where can we pull money from to make this happen? You know, and then the implementation alone, just to have a Cisco CCNE to come out to help us put it all together was, you know, having that guy come out and do the install was, you know, a sick number too. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's, you know, now we've talked a little bit about the rollout and, um, you know, and uh, had our, I guess, Meraki session. Moment. For the, yeah, Meraki, Meraki moment. Meraki moment for it's this It's a new podcast. show feature yeah. too, yeah. This the moment in Meraki. Yeah. The technology. It, I think it'd be good to you know just discuss you know what are some of the benefits that you know maybe Jason or Carrie or even Eric with your you know you've been piloting this. What are some of the benefits that you see for teachers and students? Um, you know because I, I think that's key as well. You know because if we you know after we roll this technology out and and done the PD and everybody's on board, you know what what is the aftermath? I mean what are what are you seeing in terms of positive outcomes? So whoever wants to jump on that jump. Can I? Well, I can. I can take that. That's for sure. Um, I guess um, you know it's been really positive just in in terms of the kids becoming more fluent with the technology and um, and really starting to see how it can be used uh, in instructional ways versus just you know for fun. 
which there's a, there's a place for that, that's for sure. Um, so that benefit um, has been huge for us, and the, the kids kind of taking ownership of their learning has been really cool. You know, um, one of the things that I think back to school, um, kids can just be very passively um, listening and not really be engaged in, in, in interacting, and I think the technology really helps to make it much more interactive. It also, our teachers are allowing the kids, as I said before, to choose tools themselves, and so right there, um, you're going to hook kids much more than if I say everybody has to create a PowerPoint presentation. Instead, if I say, you guys, I want you to use the tool that you can demonstrate your understanding of, say, the Civil War, um, right there, you're hooking kids immediately. And so I think that those have been you know, the, the key things for us. And the fact that we had as many kids as we did bring it in uh, was huge. And we're going to be expanding it to grades 9 through 12 next year. So. Um, I would say that the student um, engagement is a huge piece of this. And Carrie, if I can just piggyback on what you were just mentioning, I, I think Eric, or some of the Eric's, one of the Eric's, both the Eric's, we've had several discussion where, um, or I know I've had discussion that, you know, I guess there's two schools of thought. You know, one school of thought people think, or at least you know, some of the schools that I've worked with, that you know, the students have to be using Office. You know, they have to know how to use Office 20. Seven or two, sorry, 2007 or 2010, uh, you know, and, and that has to be the software. And then I, I think what you're talking about, you know, is that there's this other school of thought where, you know, they may have access to office when they're in college or when they move on to whatever their professional career is going to be. But, you know, that office is going to look completely different than the one that we're using now and really teach them to use the tools that they have at hand just to make a good presentation or, or like you said, to be creative and, and, you know, complete the project because they're not always going to have office. They're not always going to have Google Docs. You know, they're going to have to work with, you know, like you said, the tools that they have right there. And well. Yeah, yeah absolutely, key. absolutely, and I think that what where I come from is, you know, I've always I was always a PC girl and I was a Microsoft girl, and when I got into uh, this role, I now own a Mac, I own um, an iPad, I own an iPhone, I still have my tablet PC, and what's been interesting to me is I can pretty much now go on to any of those devices and do what I need to do, and truly that's what I want um, for those kids is that they can get on any device and. They they can be fluent and feel successful. Um, Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about, I don't know if you've finished any of those rollouts yet, but have you seen you know, any benefits for, your, for the teachers or students at those schools? I'm sorry, I was looking at that Meraki website. No. <laughs> I'll, tell you what, I'll, no. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in and let uh, Jason think about that question because I have a very brief one I'll throw out. Um, and the question is, what has the, what benefit has there been? Uh, again, our pilot was pretty was pretty small, so um, we didn't uh, get to do a whole lot with it. Um, but um, during that time, we came across some pretty neat tools, and I did want to share one of them uh, just to make you guys aware of. And it's uh, um, the whole idea of using these devices they bring in to replace classroom response systems um, because those are very popular, and they're excellent. Classroom response systems are great, but they can be pricey as well. And um, a smartphone um, can do, and even sometimes a dumb phone can do, a lot of the same things as that. Um, one program is called Socrative.com. They're pretty new. They've been out for maybe about a year. And um, I even talked to the guys who were, who were doing this, had a phone chat with them, really nice guys. And basically, it's a completely free uh, uh, website. And you can pull this up on your um, smartphone, on your tablet PC, on your regular computer, uh, any, any web-enabled device. And it allows you to um, create quizzes for your kids that can do formative assessment during class. It can be an exit survey at the end of class that they all fill out, and it emails you all the results of what the kids said. Uh, really, really nice. And we had our, our staff using that. Um, likewise, probably you should always mention the Poll Everywhere um, option, which uh, likewise lets you do that sort of thing, but even allows you to do texting. So if a student didn't even have a smartphone, they, they would be able to do that. So you know, those are just some pretty neat tools, um, and I know there's many, many more out there, but some that we got a chance to experiment around with when we were doing our pilot. And one of the things I think is cool about Poll Everywhere is that, you know, you can use the web-based client if you want to do the polling, but those also download as PowerPoint slides so that you can embed those in a PowerPoint. So if you're going through your presentation, you're like, okay, you know, take out your device, you know, whatever that happens to be, and they can, you know, you can do the poll. It's live right there in your PowerPoint presentation, and then you can continue to move on through your lesson. So I just thought I'd throw that out there for those of you who you know haven't been using or are not or are new to pull everywhere. 
Well, for us at CHCA, because they're getting ready to do it, um, you know, the second half of this year, I'll have more data on how the experience is going. Um, that's when we're actually going to start letting some of the students, they have kind of picked a handful of students in, in several different grades to allow them to bring in devices. We just finished the wireless rollout um, right at the beginning of the school year, so we couldn't really do anything until that was up and running. And as we're transitioning to live at EDU, we're hoping that that also goes hand in hand with this rollout. All right. Um, let's get into a little bit of, let's segue into some of the challenges that you, you might have seen uh, with rolling out uh, BYOT. And one of the questions, and maybe that we can start off with this, is if you have students bring in these devices, a lot of times, you know, we, you have an iPad with Wi-Fi, iPad with 3G. You can get other tablets like the Motorola Zoom with 3G. How do you deal with... Um, you know, students have to bring in something that has its own connection to the internet, whether that's through Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, etc. Um, I, I will say that since we kind of limited ours to, um, you know, netbooks, notebooks, and tablet PCs, that that hasn't been a huge issue for us, although we're starting to see more iPads coming in. I think as we've done right from the very beginning, we're very frank with parents, and we make sure that they understand that if they're going to buy their child a device uh, that has those capabilities of, you know, 3G capabilities, that they have to understand, because currently we created a, a guest network, and on that guest network, the kids, it's basically just just um, your uh, your um, internet, and there's no filter or anything there. I mean, I'm sorry, it's the same filter. This is what we use uh, for our regular uh, network. And so, if the kids are going to bring in 3G, you know, able devices, then the parents have to understand what that means. And so, it's it's more about educating than anything. So you're not really saying no, you can't have 3G on the device. You're just it's it's more just making sure that they're aware of the implications. Yeah, and I would say that because we haven't encouraged, you know, we're not using the, the um, smartphones at, at this point yet, and because we only have, you know, a handful of the iPads in there, I would say that it hasn't been an issue for us. However, I would think, you know, now that you bring it up, I would think that um, moving forward, probably in our um, AUP, we're going to have to make sure that we, uh, we kind of address that issue. I, I know at, at CHCA, they're covering it, um, the 3G technology with their AUP. So then we're telling parents uh, within the device recommendations not to buy that, you know, an Internet-capable device like that with the 3G technology and, and stating why. You know, we have a filter. You know, we're using HCCA, and so we have content filtering. And if they bring their own device like that with 3G, they're going to be able to bypass all of our security and safety you know, um, the other thing with that is, too, I don't know how many parents would allow a kid to have that because that's a $40 yeah. a month cost. So mm -hmm. um, if you want to pay 40 bucks for your kid to have Internet anywhere, then more power to you, I guess. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking still on that line about challenges, one that we hear coming up a lot of times as we're looking at this is, um, in addition to that, which is excellent, is where are students allowed to use the devices? Yeah. You know, you hear a couple of different camps there where you say, okay, this is just for classroom, and it's only if the teacher says so. Like this day, we're doing this, and so yes, we want to go ahead and, um, you know, take your device out and use it, but today we're, we're, we're not, and so, you know, the teacher is the, the final say on that. You, you hear that, um, and then you hear other people say, no, it's, it's, it's you know, a free-for-all, that, you know, if, if it's BYOT, it's anytime you want, anywhere you want. It's in the hallway, it's in the cafeteria, it's before school, it's after school, it's in the classroom, you know, and along that continuum, I'm sure, you know, different schools fall for different reasons. So I'm curious to see, have you put any limitations on when and where the technology can be used, and is it always pretty much the teacher is the final say? The teacher can say, you know, no, not today. You're not going to use that. Um, for us, I will say that, you know, in between classes really isn't a, a huge issue just simply because they have no time to do that kind of thing. They know that they can't take it to lunch with them. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly which classes they've been told that they can't. I'm of two minds about the whole, um, can the teacher say? On the one hand, yes, I think the final say comes down to the teacher. I do have some issues with that in that um, if we're doing this right, 
you're teach you're you're creating a culture in your classroom where the kids are using these responsibly, and so I would hope that um, there aren't very many situations where the teacher has to say unless it's really and truly the instructions about um, uh, about having conversations with each other where they don't want them you know interacting with the technology. Otherwise, my hope would be that the kids are using them properly and that that doesn't need to be you know part of that conversation. And we're we're looking at it the same way. Um, and you know, don't take it in the lunchroom because we don't want to have spilled milk on it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it comes back to classroom management. You know, mm -hmm. the teachers are in charge of their classroom. If the teacher says, "Hey, we're not using tablets today. Put them away," and we're going to pull out a piece of paper and a pencil, you know, there is no difference between that and the technology today. I'm sure that I always think of, I always like make the joke that a hundred years ago, when they went from the you know, the chalk slates in the classroom, the paper and pen, people were arguing the same stuff. But they're going to be able to take the paper everywhere, and they're going to be able to change stuff and erase stuff, and with the slate, they couldn't. And here we are going from paper and pen to, you know, a modern-day slate, you know, and we're having those same arguments again. Mm -hmm. And it really comes down to the teacher managing the classroom, you know, the kids understanding when to use it and, and respecting that. Because if they don't, then they break the acceptable use policies, mm -hmm. and they're going to get in trouble, and they're going to lose their devices. They're going to lose their privileges and access to what they need to be able to, to participate in the classroom. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good point. Uh, we do need to liken this to other things and say this is similar to other transitions we've gone through. Um, I think one thing that might be important, and I don't know if this has, have you guys have seen this happen, but it's very possible that at the beginning there's going to be this period of time where, oh my goodness, this is this crazy new thing and everybody's all excited about it. And, you know, and that's, and I think it's almost reasonable to expect some inappropriate use or some you know difficulty with management up front just because there's this novelty to this mm -hmm. and we need to get to a point where this is just integrated this is invisible this is just part of education that technology infuses everything we do and it's no longer this you know sneaky thing to have your phone and it's no longer this you know really oh wow I got to have my laptop it's oh yeah I got my phone I got my laptop you know it's just part of my day it's part of education you're absolutely right, and I would say that you know we do have you know some teachers that are saying, well, the kids are playing games when I'm teaching, and and I think that it I'm not at all surprised that the kids are still using that they're using them in that way because I'll go back to what I said before, we the kids have never been taught to use these instructionally, and so they this is going to be a long period of helping them helping the teachers understand how do I use this you know instructionally and in powerful ways to help kids learn better, and we're not there yet. It is very new so there is going to be a lot of you know all these what if type of questions that we're getting. I think we had the same experience when like most schools they moved to the smart boards you know at first it was like we have to have smart boards in every classroom and they were just putting them in and the teachers weren't really using them and now you're watching these teachers learn how to use the technology to interact with the students and they're you know developing it the kids are using it and I think that the same thing like you said as the kids use this as a not a gaming device you know it's not you know the iPad is great for games and the Xbox 360 is great for games it's how you use it to create and stop consuming so much well um I'm keeping an eye on the time here, and we are, uh, we've are we just gone over the hour mark, and so we are going to go ahead and start uh, wrapping things up. We did lose Sean. Um, he's, uh, in, it, like I said, it's not his normal recording location. He's out in, in Jersey, and uh, it's you know very possible his connection wasn't as, as reliable. Um, and so we've invited him back into the Hangout, but he has not returned. So um, we're going to go ahead and, um, and just kind of start pulling a few things together. Um, uh, Eric G, did, did you have any questions concerning BYOT that you were hoping that we would address before we start pulling this together here today? Well, I mean, you you guys mentioned uh, um, you guys mentioned that um, you know uh, teachers you know didn't feel comfortable with technology, and um, I was actually shocked when I when I mentioned this in my school district. One of our teachers who is an advocate for technology um, absolutely said, "Well, you know, I'm not ready for that." You know, the, the fact that they want to manage other devices, you know, in the classroom. And it's most likely because, you know, she sees her, her, her own children and other children in the school, you know, that they're so addicted to these devices. And how could you possibly, you know, drag them away from Angry Birds or whatever the latest zombie killing, um, you know, app is um, in, in order to learn? And, um, you know, it all comes down to professional development. And um, my my other, you know 
concern is, you know, BYOT is not a switch you just turn on. It's a long, drawn-out project mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, it's a, a way that, you know, you're adapting uh, learning in your school. And uh, that's what really needs to be driven home to the students, the parents, your faculty, to everyone. Um, that, you know, it's a cost-saving measure, but it's not going to happen overnight. Absolutely, so and that you can't, you can't, well, and, and that you can't, uh, you said it beautifully, um, that it is not a, okay, we launched and now we're set and we're, you know, that's it. Um, it really and truly, I keep telling people the work's just beginning now because it is, it is just kind of turning learning and teaching upside down at this point. And so, you know, you were mentioning the teacher that was, you know, oh, no, I don't want those devices. I think it's two things. It's a classroom management thing, which we talked about, and I think it also, um, makes the teachers understand that long-held beliefs about what instruction looks like, where I am the all-knowing and I, I will tell you guys what you're going to learn, will start to crumble a bit when the students have access to experts and resources outside of what that teacher is providing for them. And that's huge. That's huge to ask teachers to kind of switch that paradigm. I think they're also Absolutely. keeping the, the educators understanding the technology that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get into, you're stuck in your classroom, your day-to-day -day that you may not be understanding. You hear this new announcement about a fire, you know, and you're like, there's a fire? And it's, you know, <laughs> it's a new tablet. Um, I know that at CHCA last year, we did a session with the middle school teachers that I think it was probably the first time I've done a presentation in front of teachers where they actually paid attention. I think teachers are some of the worst people to educate because they never pay attention. They're always grading papers and and we did this introduction. We brought in, you know, Apple laptops, we brought in PC laptops, we brought in Kindles, we brought in, you know, iPads, everything we could get our hands on that was a technology that was currently out there that the kids would possibly be bringing in the classroom and spent uh, probably over an hour with them and showing them that and they were actually engaged the whole time. It was one of the the greatest uh, instructions that I've done with the, with teachers. Plus, we also gave away a couple of free Kindles, so that helped keep their interest. Jason, you said teachers are the worst. Have you uh, have you ever educated uh, administrators and superintendents? <laughs> yeah, you know what? Because okay. I beg to differ there. Um, but they're they're usually ex teachers, so that's why. <laughs> oh, okay, touche. <laughs> Well, Can you we, guys hear and see me? Yes, we did get Sean back, and uh, in your absence, we were just sort of uh, wrapping things up and uh, letting folks know that uh, um, there's um, way more to discuss. There's no way we're ever going to fit into the show here, but the good news is that if you go to the show notes, there's loads of links in there. Carrie was very nice to provide us with a lot of links to uh, their project, their handbooks, uh, their a presentation they've done, articles all about BYOT, uh, other schools that are using it, uh, and lots of great bookmarks there, and those are included in the show notes, as well as stuff from Mason City Schools in Ohio and Valley Local School District in Ohio that are doing some BYOT stuff. I threw our North Canton links in there as well if you want to see our survey and some other things like that. And there's some additional links beyond that. So there's a lot of good stuff there to continue the uh, learning process beyond beyond what we're doing. But wow, we just can't say enough thanks to uh, Carrie and Jason for joining us and bringing their expertise today. Thank you yeah, for having thank us. Thank you guys very much. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. I had fun. All right, Eric uh, G., you want to let people know how they can get in touch with us? Sure, but before that, I was going to offer uh, both Carrie and Jason. Um, you know, how do, how can our audience get in touch with you guys if if you want them to? I think that um, Eric Eric C included that on the show notes, I believe. So gotcha, gotcha. Yep. Okie doke. Well, um, then I'd just like to thank the audience for listening, and um, you know, here are a couple of ways that you can get in contact with us um, on our website um, at uh, thestateoftech.org. Uh, is a way to get get a hold of us. Um, we are at the state of tech on Twitter and the state of tech at gmail dot com and you can also call us. We have a Google Voice account. It's five one three three one eight T E C H. So uh, please don't remember or I'm sorry, please don't forget <laughs> to uh, read over the show notes again on uh, the state of tech dot org and uh, leave a comment or two on our blog. We love to read them and, and uh, discuss those later. Uh, also, rate us in iTunes. Uh, I'd love to get our, our show ratings up higher. Eric, you told us, uh, you told Sean and I that uh, 
we were up there, and I don't recall what, what well, it was. Well, you were too new probably to have any sort of rating right now, but we were on the new and notable section, which I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say, like, yeah, I, I think maybe if you just make a podcast about your dog, <laughs> you might show up on there. So I don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much there, but we were on new and notable. In the, uh, we're in the education and then the uh, education technology section. Um, uh, we also want to mention about our next episodes coming up here. Um, I think we've got a uh, November 5th will be the next recording, and that is on tablets in schools. So uh, a lot of talk about things like the iPad and the Fire and uh, the Galaxy Tab and so forth. And then two weeks after that, the next episode is going to be on creative tech support. We're going to be taking a look at what districts are doing beyond the normal thoughts. So perhaps things like student tech teams, parent volunteers, interns from local technical colleges, uh, and other options like that and try to see what uh, teachers, what, what schools are doing to increase technology support um, all around the state of Ohio. Great. Anybody have anything else for the good of the order? Nope. Sean, you look like you want to say something. Uh, I was just going to say I, I can't wait to get back on my time where cable connection that works in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. Yes, I. Uh, it sounds like these people are coming home, so I gotta go. But um, anyway, this has been the State of Tech, and we will see you in another two weeks for another State of Tech. Thanks.